The Expendables by A. Van Vogt, narrated by Insomnia Audiobooks. Chapter 1 109 years after leaving Earth, the spaceship Hope of Man went into orbit around Alta III. The following morning, Captain Brown informed the shipload of fourth- and fifth-generation colonists that a manned lifeboat would be dropped to the planet's surface. Every member of the crew must consider himself expendable, he said earnestly. This is the day that our great-grandparents, our forefathers, who boldly set out for the new space frontier so long ago, looked forward to with unfaltering courage. We must not fail them. He concluded his announcement over the intercom system of the big ship by saying that the names of the crew members of the lifeboat would be given out within the hour. And I know that every real man aboard will want to see his name there. John Lesby, the fifth of his line aboard, had a sinking sensation as he heard those words, and he was not mistaken. Even as he tried to decide if he should give the signal for a desperate act of rebellion, Captain Brown made the expected announcement. The commander said, And I know you will all join him in his moment of pride and courage when I tell you that John Lesby will lead the crew that carries the hopes of man in this remote area of space, and now the others. He thereupon named seven of the nine persons with whom Lesby had been conspiring to seize control of the ship. Since the lifeboat would only hold eight persons, Lesby recognized that Brown was dispatching as many of his enemies as he could. He listened with a developing dismay as the commander ordered all persons on the ship to come to the recreation room. Here I request that the crew of the lifeboat join me and the other officers on stage. Their instructions are to surrender themselves to any craft which seeks to intercept them. They will be equipped with instruments whereby we here can watch and determine the stage of scientific attainments of the dominant race on the planet below. Lesby hurried to his room on the technician's deck, hoping that perhaps Tellier or Cantlin would seek him out there. He felt himself in need of a council of war, however brief. He waited five minutes, but not one member of his conspiratorial group showed. Nonetheless, he had time to grow calm. Peculiarly, it was the smell of the ship that soothed him most. From the earliest days of his life, the odor of energy and the scent of metal under stress had been perpetual companions. At the moment, with the ship in orbit, there was a letting up of stress. The smell was of old energies rather than new, but the effect was similar. He sat in the chair he used for reading, eyes closed, breathing in that complex of odors, product of so many titanic energies. Sitting there, he felt the fear leave his mind and body. He grew brave again and strong. Lesby recognized soberly that his plan to seize power had involved risks. Worse, no one would question Brown's choice of him as the leader of the mission. I am, thought Lesby, probably the most highly trained technician ever to be on this ship. Brown III had taken him when he was ten, and started him on the long grind of learning that led him one after the other to master the mechanical skills of all the various technical departments, and Brown IV had continued his training. He was taught how to repair relay systems. He gradually came to understand the purposes of countless analogs, the time came when he could visualize the entire automation. Long ago, the colossal cobweb of electronic instruments within the walls had become almost an extension of his nervous system. During those years of work and study, each daily apprenticeship chore left his slim body exhausted. After he came off duty, he sought a brief relaxation and usually retired to an early rest. He never did find the time to learn the intricate theory that underlay the ship's many operations. His father, while he was alive, had made numerous attempts to pass his knowledge on to his son. But it was hard to teach complexities to a tired and sleepy boy. Lesby even felt slightly relieved when his parent died. It took the pressure off him. Since then, however, he had come to realize that the Brown family, by forcing a lesser skill on the descendant of the original commander of the ship, had won their greatest victory. As he headed finally for the recreation room, Lesby found himself wondering had the Browns trained him with the intention of preparing him for such a mission as this? His eyes widened. If that was true, then his own conspiracy was merely an excuse. The decision to kill him might actually have been made more than a decade ago, and light years away. As the lifeboat fell toward Alta III, Lesby and Tellier sat in the twin control chairs and watched on the forward screen the vast misty atmosphere of the planet. 
Tellier was thin and intellectual, a descendant of the physicist Dr. Tellier, who had made many speed experiments in the early days of the voyage. It had never been understood why spaceships could not attain even a good fraction of the speed of light, let alone velocities greater than light. When the scientist met his untimely death, there was no one with the training to carry on a testing program. It was vaguely believed by the trained personnel who succeeded Tellier that the ship had run into one of the paradoxes implicit in the Lorenz Fitzgerald contraction theory. Whatever the explanation, it was never solved. Watching Tellier, Lesby wondered if his companion and best friend felt as empty inside as he did. Incredibly, this was the first time he or anyone had been outside the big ship. We're actually heading down, he thought, to one of those great masses of land and water, a planet. As he watched, fascinated, the massive ball grew visibly bigger. They came in at a slant, a long, swift, angling approach, ready to jet away if any of the natural radiation belts proved too much for their defense systems. But as each stage of radiation registered in turn, the dials showed that the lifeboat machinery made the proper responses automatically. The silence was shattered suddenly by an alarm bell. Simultaneously, one of the screens focused on a point of rapidly moving light far below. The light darted toward them. A missile. Lesby caught his breath, but the shining projectile veered off, turned completely around, took up position several miles away, and began to fall with them. His first thought was, they'll never let us land. And he experienced an intense disappointment. Another signal burred from the control board. They're probing us, said Tellier tensely. An instant after the words were uttered, the lifeboat seemed to shudder and to stiffen under them. It was the unmistakable feel of a tractor beam. Its field clutched the lifeboat, drew it, held it. The science of the Alta Three inhabitants was already proving itself formidable. Underneath him, the lifeboat continued its movement. The entire crew gathered around and watched as the point of brightness resolved into an object which rapidly grew larger. It loomed up close, bigger than they. There was a metallic bump. The lifeboat shuddered from stem to stern. Even before the vibrations ceased, Tellier said, Notice they put our airlock against theirs. Behind Lesby, his companions began that peculiar joking of the threatened. It was a coarse comedy, but it had enough actual humor suddenly to break through his fear. Involuntarily, he found himself laughing, then momentarily free of anxiety. Aware that Brown was watching and that there was no escape, he said, Open the airlock. Let the aliens capture us as ordered. Chapter 2 A few minutes after the outer airlock was opened, the airlock of the alien ship folded back also. Rubberized devices rolled out and contacted the Earth lifeboat, sealing off both entrances from the vacuum of space. Air hissed into the interlocking passageway between the two craft. In the alien craft's lock, an inner door opened. Again, Lesby held his breath. There was a movement in the passageway. A creature ambled into view. The being came forward with complete assurance and pounded with something he held at the end of one of his four leathery arms on the hull. The creature had four legs and four arms, and a long, thin body held straight up. It had almost no neck, yet the many skin folds between the head and the body indicated great flexibility was possible. Even as Lesby noted the details of its appearance, the being turned his head slightly and its two large expressionless eyes gazed straight at the hidden wall receptor that was photographing the scene, and therefore straight into Lesby's eyes. Lesby blinked at the creature, then tore his gaze away, swallowed hard, and nodded at Tellier. Open up, he commanded. The moment the inner door of the Earth lifeboat opened, six more of the four-legged beings appeared one after another in the passageway, and walked forward in the same confident way as had the first. All seven creatures entered the open door of the lifeboat. As they entered, their thoughts came instantly into Lesby's mind. As Zing and his boarding party trotted from the small Karn ship through the connecting airlock, his chief officer thought a message to him. Air pressure and oxygen content are within a tiny percentage of what exists at ground level on Karn. They can certainly live on our planet. Zing moved forward into the Earth ship and realized that he was in the craft's control chamber. There, for the first time, he saw the men. He and his crew ceased their forward motion, and the two groups of beings, the humans and the Karn, gazed at each other. The appearance of the two-legged beings did not surprise Zing. 
Pulse viewers had earlier penetrated the metal walls of the lifeboat and had accurately photographed the shape and dimension of those aboard. His first instruction to his crew was designed to test if the strangers were in fact surrendering. He commanded, Convey to the prisoners that we require them as a precaution to remove their clothing. Until that direction was given, Lesby was still uncertain as to whether or not these beings could receive human thoughts, as he was receiving theirs. From the first moment, the aliens had conducted their mental conversations as if they were unaware of the thoughts of the human beings. Now, he watched the Karn come forward. One tugged suggestively at his clothing, and there was no doubt. The mental telepathy was a one-way flow only from the Karn to the humans. He was already savoring the implications of that as he hastily undressed. It was absolutely vital that Brown do not find it out. Lesby removed all his clothes, then before laying them down, took out his notebook and pen. Standing there naked, he wrote hurriedly, Don't let on that we can read the minds of these beings. He handed the notebook around and he felt a lot better as each of the men read it and nodded at him silently. Zing communicated telepathically with someone on the ground. These strangers, he reported, I clearly acted under command to surrender. The problem is, how can we now let them overcome us without arousing their suspicion that this is what we want them to do? Lesby did not receive the answer directly, but he picked it up from Zing's mind. Start tearing the lifeboat apart, see if that brings a reaction. The members of the Karn boarding party went to work at once. Off came the control panels, floor plates were melted and ripped up. Soon instruments, wiring, controls were exposed for examination. Most interesting of all to the aliens were the numerous computers and their accessories. Brown must have watched the destruction. For now, before the Karn could start wrecking the automatic machinery, his voice interjected, Watch out, you men. I'm going to shut your airlock and cause your boat to make a sharp right turn in exactly 20 seconds. For Lesby and Tellier, that simply meant sitting down in their chairs and turning them so that the acceleration pressure would press them against the backs. The other men sank to the ripped-up floor and braced themselves. Underneath Zing, the ship swerved. The turn began slowly, but it propelled him and his fellows over to one wall of the control room. There he grabbed with his numerous hands at some handholds that had suddenly moved out from the smooth metal. By the time the turn grew sharper, he had his four short legs braced, and he took the rest of the wide swing around with every part of his long, sleek body taut. His companions did the same. Presently, the awful pressure eased up, and he was able to estimate that their new direction was almost at right angles to what it had been. He had reported what was happening while it was going on. Now the answer came, keep on destroying, see what they do, and be prepared to succumb to anything that looks like a lethal attack, Lesby wrote quickly in his notebook. Our method of capturing them doesn't have to be subtle. They'll make it easy for us so we can't lose. Lesby waited tensely as the notebook was passed around. It was still hard for him to believe that no one else had noticed what he had about this boarding party. Tellier added a note of his own. It's obvious now that these beings were also instructed to consider themselves expendable. And that settled it for Lesby. The others hadn't noticed what he had. He sighed with relief at the false analysis, for it gave him that most perfect of all advantages, that which derived from his special education. Apparently, he alone knew enough to have analyzed what these creatures were. The proof was in the immense clarity of their thoughts. Long ago, on Earth, it had been established that man had a faltering telepathic ability, which could be utilized consistently only by electronic amplification outside his brain. The amount of energy needed for the step-up process was enough to burn out brain nerves if applied directly. Since the Karn were utilizing it directly, they couldn't be living beings. Therefore, Zing and his fellows were an advanced robot type. The true inhabitants of Alta III were not risking their own skins at all, far more important to Lesby. He could see how he might use these marvelous mechanisms to defeat Brown, take over the hope of man, and start the long journey back to Earth. Uh, chapter 3 He had been watching the Karn at their work of destruction while he had these thoughts. Now he said aloud, Hanker, Graves, yes. The two men spoke together. In a few moments I'm going to ask Captain Brown to turn the ship again. When he does, use our specimen gas guns. The men grinned with relief. Consider it done, said Hanker. 
Lesby ordered the other four crewmen to be ready to use the specimen holding devices at top speed. De Tellier, he said, you take charge if anything happens to me. Then he wrote one more message in the notebook. These beings will probably continue their mental intercommunication after they are apparently rendered unconscious. Pay no attention and do not comment on it in any way. He felt a lot better when that statement also had been read by the others, and the notebook was once more in his possession. Quickly, he spoke to the screen. Captain Brown, make another turn, just enough to pin them. And so they captured Zing and his crew. As he had expected, the Karn continued their telepathic conversation. Zing reported to his ground contact. I think we did that rather well. There must have been an answering message from below because he went on. Yes, Commander, we are now prisoners as per your instructions and shall await events. The imprisoning method? Each of us is pinned down by a machine which has been placed astride us, with the main section adjusted to the contour of our bodies. A series of rigid metal appendages fasten our arms and legs. All these devices are electronically controlled, and we can of course escape at any time. Naturally, such action is for later. Lesby was chilled by the analysis, but for Expendables there was no turning back. He ordered his men, Get dressed, then start repairing the ship. Put all the floor plates back, except the section at G8. They remove some of the analogs. And I'd better make sure myself that it all goes back all right. When he had dressed, he reset the course of the lifeboat and called Brown. The screen lit up after a moment, and there staring back at him was the unhappy countenance of the forty-year-old officer. Brown said glumly, I want to congratulate you and your crew on your accomplishments. It would seem that we have a small scientific superiority over this race, and that we can attempt a limited landing. Since there would never be a landing on Alta Three, Lesby simply waited without comment as Brown seemed lost in thought. The officer stirred, finally. He still seemed uncertain. Mr. Lesby, he said, as you must understand, this is an extremely dangerous situation for me, and, he added hastily, for this entire expedition. What struck Lesby, as he heard those words, was that Brown was not going to let him back on the ship. But he had to get aboard to accomplish his own purpose. He thought, I'll have to bring this whole conspiracy out into the open and apparently make a compromise offer. He drew a deep breath, gazed straight into the eyes of Brown's image on the screen, and said with the complete courage of a man for whom there is no turning back, it seems to me, sir, that we have two alternatives. We can resolve all these personal problems either through a democratic election or by a joint captaincy, you being one of the captains and I being the other. To any other person who might have been listening, the remark must have seemed a complete non sequitur. Brown, however, understood its relevance. He said with a sneer, So you're out in the open. Well, let me tell you, Mr. Lesby, there was never any talk of elections when the Lesbys were in power, and for a very good reason, a spaceship requires a technical aristocracy to command it. As for a joint captaincy, it wouldn't work. Lesby urged his lie. If we're going to stay here, we'll need at least two people of equal authority, one on the ground, one on the ship. I couldn't trust you on the ship, said Brown flatly. Then you be on the ship, Lesby proposed. All such practical details can be arranged. The older man must have been almost beside himself with the intensity of his own feelings on this subject. He flashed, Your family has been out of power for over fifty years. How can you still feel that you have any rights? Lesby countered, How come you still know what I'm talking about? Brown said, a grinding rage in his tone. The concept of inherited power was introduced by the first Lesby. It was never planned. But here you are, said Lesby, yourself a beneficiary of inherited power. Brown said from between clenched teeth, It's absolutely ridiculous that the Earth government, which was in power when the ship left, and every member of which has been long dead, should appoint somebody to a command position, and that now his descendant think that command post should be his, and his family's, for all time. Lesby was silent, startled by the dark emotions he had uncovered in the man. He felt even more justified, if that were possible, and advanced his next suggestion without a qualm. Captain, this is a crisis. We should postpone our private struggle. Why don't we bring one of these prisoners aboard so that we can question him by use of films or play acting? Later we can discuss your situation and mine. He saw from the look on Brown's face that the reasonableness of the suggestion and its potentialities were penetrating. Brown said quickly, Only you come aboard and with one prisoner only, no one else. Lesby felt a dizzying thrill 
as the man responded to his bait. He thought, it's like an exercise in logic. He'll try to murder me as soon as he gets me alone and is satisfied that he can attack without danger to himself. But that very scheme is what will get me aboard, and I've got to get on the ship to carry out my plan. Brown was frowning. He said in a concerned tone, Mr. Lesby, can you think of any reason why we should not bring one of these beings aboard? Lesby shook his head. No reason, sir, he lied. Brown seemed to come to a decision. Very well, I'll see you shortly, and we can then discuss additional details. Lesby dared not say another word. He nodded and broke the connection, shuddering, disturbed, uneasy. But, he thought, what else can we do? He turned his attention to the part of the floor that had been left open for him. Quickly, he bent down and studied the codes on each of the programming units, as if he were seeking exactly the right ones that had originally been in those slots. He found the series he wanted, an intricate system of cross-connected units that had originally been designed to program a remote control landing system, an advanced Waldo mechanism capable of landing the craft on a planet and taking off again, all directed on the pulse level of human thought. He slid each unit of the series into its sequential position and locked it in. Then, that important task completed, he picked up the remote control attachment for the series and casually put it in his pocket. He returned to the control board and spent several minutes examining the wiring and comparing it with a wall chart. A number of wires had been torn loose. These he now reconnected, and at the same time he managed with a twist of his pliers to short-circuit a key relay of the remote control pilot. Lesby replaced the panel itself loosely. There was no time to connect it properly, and since he could easily justify his next move, he pulled a cage out of the storeroom. Into this, he hoisted zing, manacles, and all. Before lowering the lid, he rigged into the cage a simple resistor that would prevent the Karn from broadcasting on the human thought level. The device was simple merely in that it was not selective. It had an on-off switch, which triggered or stopped energy flow in the metal walls on the thought level. When the device was installed, Lesby slipped the tiny remote control for it into his other pocket. He did not activate the control. Not yet. From the cage, Zing telepathed. It is significant that these beings have selected me for this special attention. We might conclude that it is a matter of mathematical accident, or else that they are very observant, and so noticed that I was the one who directed activities. Whatever the reason, it would be foolish to turn back now. A bell began to ring. As Lesby watched, a spot of light appeared high on one of the screens. It moved rapidly towards some crossed lines in the exact center of the screen. Inexorably, then, the hope of man is represented by the light, and the lifeboat moved toward their fateful rendezvous. Chapter 4 Brown's instructions were, Come to control room below. Lesby guided his powered dolly with the cage on it out of the big ship's airlock and saw that the man in the control room of the lock was Second Officer Selwyn, heavy brass for such a routine task. Selwyn waved at him with a twisted smile as Lesby wheeled his cargo along the silent corridor. He saw no one else on his route. Other personnel had evidently been cleared from this part of the vessel. A little later, grim and determined, he set the cage down in the center of the big room and anchored it magnetically to the floor. As Lesby entered the captain's office, Brown looked up from one of the two control chairs and stepped down from the rubber-sheathed dais to the same level as Lesby. He came forward, smiling, and held out his hand. He was a big man, as all the Browns had been, bigger by a head than Lesby, good-looking in a clean-cut way. The two men were alone. I'm glad you were so frank, he said. I doubt if I could have spoken so bluntly to you without your initiative as an example. But as they shook hands, Lesby was wary and suspicious. Lesby thought, He's trying to recover from the insanity of his reaction. I really blew him wide open. Brown continued in the same hearty tone. I've made up my mind. An election is out of the question. The ship is swarming with untrained dissident groups, most of which simply want to go back to Earth. Lesby, who had the same desire, was discreetly silent. Brown said, You'll be ground captain, I'll be ship captain. Why don't we sit down right now and work out a communique on which we can agree and that I can read over the intercom to the others? As Lesby seated himself in the chair beside Brown, he was thinking, What can be gained from publicly naming me ground captain? He concluded finally, cynically, 
that the older man could gain the confidence of John Lesby, lull him, lead him on, delude him, destroy him. Surreptitiously, Lesby examined the room. Control room below was a large square chamber adjoining the massive central engines. Its control board was a duplicate of the one on the bridge located at the top of the ship. The great vessel could be guided equally from either board, except that preemptive power was on the bridge. The officer of the watch was given the right to make merit decisions in an emergency. Lesby made a quick mental calculation and deduced that it was First Officer Miller's watch on the bridge. Miller was a staunch supporter of Brown. The man was probably watching them on one of his screens, ready to come to Brown's aid at a moment's notice. A few minutes later, Lesby listened thoughtfully as Brown read their joint communique over the intercom, designating him as ground captain. He found himself a little amazed and considerably dismayed at the absolute confidence the older man must feel about his own power and position on the ship. It was a big step, naming his chief rival to so high a rank. Brown's next act was equally surprising. While they were still on the viewers, Brown reached over, clapped Lesby affectionately on the shoulders, and said to the watching audience, As you all know, John is the only direct descendant of the original captain. No one knows exactly what happened half a hundred years ago when my grandfather first took command, but I remember the old man always felt that only he understood how things should be. I doubt if he had any confidence in any young whippersnapper over whom he did not have complete control. I often felt that my father was the victim rather than the beneficiary of my grandfather's temper and feelings of superiority. Brown smiled engagingly. Anyway, good people, though we can't unbreak the eggs that were broken then, we can certainly start healing the wounds without... His tone was suddenly firm, negating the fact that my own training and experience make me the proper commander of the ship itself. He broke off. Captain Lesby and I shall now jointly attempt to communicate with the captured intelligent life form from the planet below. You may watch, though. We reserve the right to cut you off for good reason. He turned to Lesby. What do you think we should do first, John? Lesby was in a dilemma. The first large doubt had come to him, the possibility that perhaps the other was sincere. The possibility was especially disturbing because in a few moments a part of his own plan would be revealed. He sighed, and realized that there was no turning back at this stage. He thought, we'll have to bring the entire madness out into the open, and only then can we begin to consider. Agreement is real. Aloud, he said in a steady voice, why not bring the prisoner out where we can see him? As the tractor beam lifted Zing out of the cage, and thus away from the energies that had suppressed his thought waves, the car and telepath to his contact on Alta 3 had been held in a confined space, the metal of which was energized against communication. I shall now attempt to perceive and evaluate the condition and performance of this ship. At that point, Brown reached over and clicked off the intercom. Having shut off the audience, he turned accusingly to Lesby and said, Explain your failure to inform me that these beings communicated by telepathy. The tone of his voice was threatening. There was a hint of angry color in his face. It was the moment of discovery. Lesby hesitated, and then simply pointed out how precarious their relationship had been. He finished frankly, I thought by keeping it a secret I might be able to stay alive a little longer, which was certainly not what you intended when you sent me out as an expendable. Brown snapped. But how did you hope to utilize? He stopped. Never mind, he muttered. Zing was telepathing again. In many ways, this is mechanically a very advanced type ship. Atomic energy drives are correctly installed. The automatic machinery performs magnificently. There's massive energy screen equipment, and they can put out a tractor beam to match anything we have that's mobile. But there is a wrongness in the energy flows of this ship, which I lack the experience to interpret. Let me furnish you some data. The data consisted of variable wave measurements. Evidently, so Lesby deduced the wavelengths of the energy flows involved in the wrongness. He set an alarm at that point. Better drop him into the cage while we analyze what he could be talking about. Brown did so as Zing telepathed. If what you suggest is true, then these beings are completely at our mercy. Cut off. Brown was turning on the intercom. Sorry I had to cut you good people off, he said. You'll be interested to know that we have managed to tune in on the thought pulses of the prisoner and have intercepted his calls to someone on the planet below. This gives us an advantage. He turned to Lesby. Don't you agree? 
Brown visibly showed no anxiety, whereas Zing's final statement flabbergasted Lesby. Completely at our mercy. Surely meant exactly that. He was staggered that Brown could have missed the momentous meaning. Brown addressed him enthusiastically. I'm excited by this telepathy. It's a marvelous shortcut to communication if we could build up our own thought pulses. Maybe we could use the principle of the remote control landing device, which, as you know, can project human thoughts on a simple gross level where ordinary energies get confused by the intense field needed for the landing. What interested Lesby in the suggestion was that he had in his pocket a remote control for precisely such mechanically produced thought pulses. Unfortunately, the control was for the lifeboat. It probably would be advisable to tune the control to the ship landing system also. It was a problem he had thought of earlier, and now Brown had opened the way for an easy solution. He held his voice steady as he said, Captain, let me program those landing analogs while you prepare the film communication project. That way we can be ready for him either way. Brown seemed to be completely trusting, for he agreed at once. At Brown's direction, a film projector was wheeled in. It was swiftly mounted on solid connections at one end of the room. The cameraman and third officer Mindel, who had come in with him, strapped themselves into two adjoining chairs attached to the projector, and were evidently ready. While this was going on, Lesby called various technical personnel. Only one technician protested. But John, he said, that way we have a double control with the lifeboat control having preemption over the ship. That's very unusual. It was unusual. But it was the lifeboat control that was in his pocket, where he could reach it quickly. And so he said adamantly, Do you want to talk to Captain Brown? Do you want his okay? No, no. The technician's doubts seemed to subside. I heard you being named Joint Captain. You're the boss. It shall be done. Lesby put down the closed-circuit phone into which he had been talking and turned. It was then he saw that the film was ready to roll, and that Brown had his fingers on the controls of the tractor beam. The older man stared at him questioningly. Shall I go ahead? he asked. At this penultimate moment, Lesby had a qualm. Almost immediately, he realized that the only alternative to what Brown planned was that he reveal his own secret knowledge. He hesitated, torn by doubts. Then, will you turn that off? He indicated the intercom. Brown said to the audience, we'll bring you in again on this in a minute, good people. He broke the connection and gazed questioningly at Lesby. Whereupon Lesby said in a low voice, Captain, I should inform you that I brought the Karn aboard in the hope of using him against you. Well, that is a frank and open admission, the officer replied very softly. I mentioned this, said Lesby, because if you had similar ulterior motives, we should clear the air completely before proceeding with this attempt at communication. A blossom of color spread from Brown's neck over his face. At last, he said slowly, I don't know how I can convince you, but I had no schemes. Lesby gazed at Brown's open countenance, and suddenly he realized that the officer was sincere. Brown had accepted the compromise. The solution of a joint captaincy was agreeable to him. Sitting there, Lesby experienced an enormous joy. Seconds went by before he realized what underlay the intense, pleasurable excitement. It was simply the discovery that communication worked. You could tell your truth and get a hearing, if it made sense. It seemed to him that his truth made a lot of sense. He was offering Brown peace aboard the ship. Peace at a price, of course, but still peace. And in this severe emergency, Brown recognized the entire validity of the solution. So it was now evident to Lesby. Without further hesitation, he told Brown that the creatures who had boarded the lifeboat were robots not alive at all. Brown was nodding thoughtfully. Finally, he said, but I don't see how this could be utilized to take over the ship. Lesby said patiently, As you know, sir, the remote landing control system includes five principal ideas which are projected very forcibly on the thought level. Three of these are for guidance up, down, and sideways. Intense magnetic fields, any one of which could partially jam a complex robot's thinking processes. The fourth and fifth are instructions to blast either up or down. The force of the blast depends on how far the control is turned on. Since the energy used is overwhelming, those simple commands would take preemption over the robot. When that first one came aboard the lifeboat, I had a scan receiver non-detectable on him. This registered two power sources, one pointing forward, one backward from the chest level. That's why I had him on his back when I brought him in here. But the fact is, I could have had him tilted and pointing at a target and activated. 
either Control 4 or 5, thus destroying whatever was in the path of the resulting blast. Naturally, I took all possible precautions to make sure that this did not happen, until you had indicated what you intended to do. One of these precautions would enable us to catch this creature's thoughts without... As he was speaking, he eagerly put his hand into his pocket, intending to show the older man the tiny on-off control device by which, when it was off, they would be able to read Zing's thoughts without removing him from the cage. He stopped short in his explanation because an ugly expression had come suddenly into Brown's face. The big man glanced at Third Officer Mendel. Well, Dan, he said, do you think that's it? Lesby noticed with shock that Mendel had on sound amplifying earphones. He must have overheard every word that Brown and he had spoken to each other. Mendel nodded. Yes, Captain, he said. I very definitely think he has now told us what we wanted to find out. Lesby grew aware that Brown had released himself from his acceleration safety belt and was stepping away from his seat. The officer turned and, standing very straight, said in a formal tone, Technician Lesby, we have heard your admission of gross dereliction of duty, conspiracy to overthrow the lawful government of this ship, scheme to utilize alien creatures to destroy human beings, and confession of other unspeakable crimes. In this extremely dangerous situation, summary execution without formal trial is justified. I therefore sentence you to death and order Third Officer Dan Mandel to... He faltered and came to a stop. Chapter 5-2 Things had been happening as he talked. Lesby squeezed the off switch of the cage control, an entirely automatic gesture, convulsive, a spasmodic movement, result of his dismay. It was a mindless gesture. So far as he knew consciously, freeing Zing's thoughts had no useful possibility for him. His only real hope, as he realized almost immediately, was to get his other hand into his remaining coat pocket and with it manipulate the remote control landing device, the secret of which he had so naively revealed to Brown. The second thing that happened was that Zing, released from mental control, telepathed, free again and this time of course permanently, I have just now activated by remote control the relays that will in a few moments start the engines of this ship, and I have naturally reset the mechanism for controlling the rate of acceleration. His thoughts must have impinged progressively on Brown, for it was at that point that the officer paused uncertainly. Zing continued, I verified your analysis. This vessel does not have the internal energy flows of an interstellar ship. These two-legged beings have therefore failed to achieve the light speed effect, which alone makes possible translight velocities. I suspect they have taken many generations to make this journey are far indeed for their home base, and I'm sure I can capture them all. Lesby reached over, tripped on the intercom, and yelled at the screen. All stations prepare for emergency acceleration. Grab anything. To Brown, he shouted. Get to your seat quick. His actions were automatic responses to danger. Only after the words were spoken did it occur to him that he had no interest in the survival of Captain Brown. And that, in fact, the only reason the man was in danger was because he had stepped away from his safety belt so that Mindell's blaster would kill Lesby without damaging Brown. Brown evidently understood his danger. He started toward the control chair from which he had released himself only moments before. His reaching hands were still a foot or more from it when the impact of acceleration one stopped him. He stood there trembling like a man who had struck an invisible but palpable wall. The next instant acceleration two caught him and thrust him on his back to the floor. He began to slide toward the rear of the room, faster and faster, and because he was quick and understanding, he pressed the palms of his hands and his rubber shoes hard against the floor and so tried to slow the movement of his body. Lesby was picturing other people elsewhere in the ship desperately trying to save themselves. He groaned, for the commander's failure was probably being duplicated everywhere. Even as he had that thought, Acceleration 3 caught Brown. Like a rock propelled by a catapult, he shot toward the rear wall. It was cushioned to protect human beings, and so it reacted like rubber, bouncing him a little. But the stuff had only momentary resilience. Acceleration 4 pinned Brown halfway into the cushioned wall. From its imprisoning depths, he managed a strangled yell. Lesby, put a tractor beam on me. Save me. I'll make it up to you. I eat it. Acceleration 5 choked off the words. The man's appeal brought momentary wonder to Lesby. He was amazed that Brown hoped for mercy after what had happened. Brown's anguished words did produce one effect in him. They reminded him that there was something he must do. 
he forced his hand and his arm to the control board and focused a tractor beam that firmly captured third officer Mindell and the cameraman. His intense effort was barely in time. Acceleration followed acceleration, making movement impossible. The time between each surge of increased speed grew longer. The slow minutes lengthened into what seemed an hour, then many hours. Lesby was held in his chair as if he were gripped by hands of steel. His eyes felt glassy. His body had long since lost all feeling. He noticed something. The rate of acceleration was different from what the original Tellier had prescribed long ago. The actual increase in forward pressure each time was less. He realized something else. For a long time, no thoughts had come from the card. Suddenly he felt an odd shift in speed. A physical sensation of slight, very slight, angular movement accompanied the maneuver. Slowly the metal-like bands let go of his body. The numb feeling was replaced by the pricking as of thousands of tiny needles. Instead of muscle compressing acceleration, there was only a steady pressure. It was the pressure that he had in the past equated with gravity. Lesby stirred hopefully, and when he felt himself move, realized what had happened. The artificial gravity had been shut off. Simultaneously, the ship had made a half turn within its outer shell. The drive power was now coming from below, a constant one gravity thrust. At this late, late moment, he plunged his hand into the pocket which held the remote control for the pilotless landing mechanism and activated it. That ought to turn on his thoughts, he told himself savagely, but if Zing was telepathing to his masters, it was no longer on the human thought level. So Lesby concluded unhappily. The ether was silent. He now grew aware of something more. The ship smelled different, better, cleaner, purer. Lesby's gaze snapped over to the speed dials on the control board, the figures registering there were unbelievable. They indicated that the spaceship was traveling at a solid fraction of the speed of light. Lesby stared at the numbers incredulously. We didn't have time, he thought. How could we go so fast so quickly in hours only to near the speed of light? Sitting there, breathing hard, fighting to recover from the effects of that prolonged speed up, he felt the fantastic reality of the universe. During all this slow century of flight through space, the hope of man had had the potential for this vastly greater velocity. He visualized the acceleration series so expertly programmed by Zing as having achieved a shift to a new state of matter in motion. The light speed effect, the Karn robot had called it. And Tellier missed it, he thought. All those experiments the physicist had performed so painstakingly and left a record of had missed the great discovery, missed it, and so a shipload of human beings had wandered for generations through the black deeps of interstellar space. Across the room, Brown was climbing groggily to his feet. He muttered, Better get back to control chair. He had taken only a few uncertain steps when a realization seemed to strike him. He looked up then and stared wildly at Lesby. Oh, he said. The sound came from the gut level, a gasp of horrified understanding. As he slapped a complex of tractor beams on Brown, Lesby said, That's right, you're looking at your enemy. Better start talking. We haven't much time. Brown was pale now, but his mouth had been left free, and so he was able to say huskily, I did what any lawful government does in an emergency. I dealt with treason summarily, taking time only to find out what it consisted of. Lesby had had another thought, this time about Miller on the bridge. Hastily, he swung Brown over in front of him. Hand me your blaster, he said. Stock first. He freed the other's arm so that he could reach into the holster and take it out. Lesby felt a lot better when he had the weapon, but still another idea had come to him. He said harshly, I want to lift you over to the cage, and I don't want First Officer Miller to interfere. Get that, Mr. Miller. There was no answer from the screen, Brown said uneasily. Fly over to the cage. Lesby did not answer right away. Silently, he manipulated the tractor beam control until Brown was in position. Having gotten him there, Lesby hesitated. What bothered him was, why had the Karn's thought impulses ceased? He had an awful feeling that something was very wrong indeed. He gulped and said, Raise the lid! Again, he freed Brown's arm. The big man reached over gingerly, unfastened the catch, and then drew back and glanced questioningly at Lesby. Look inside, Lesby commanded. Brown said scathingly, you don't think for one second that... He stopped, for he was peering into the cage. He uttered a cry. He's gone. Chapter 6 Lesby discussed the disappearance with Brown. 
It was an abrupt decision on his part to do so. The question of where Zing might have got to was not something he should merely turn over in his own head. He began by pointing at the dials, from which the immense speed of the ship could be computed, and then, when that meaning was absorbed by the older man, said simply, What happened? Where did he go? And how could we speed up to just under 186,000 miles a second in so short a time? He'd lowered the big man to the floor, and now he took some of the tension from the tractor beam but did not release the power. Brown stood in apparent deep thought. Finally, he nodded. All right, he said, I know what happened. Tell me. Brown changed the subject, said in a deliberate tone. What are you going to do with me? Lesby stared at him for a moment unbelievingly. You're going to withhold this information? He demanded. Brown spread his hands. What else can I do? Till I know my fate, I have nothing to lose. Lesby suppressed a strong impulse to rush over and strike his prisoner. He said finally, In your judgment, is this delay dangerous? Brown was silent, but a bead of sweat trickled down his cheek. I have nothing to lose, he repeated. The expression in Lesby's face must have alarmed him, for he went on quickly. Look, there's no need for you to conspire anymore. What you really want is to go home, isn't it, don't you see? With this new method of acceleration, we can make it to Earth in a few months. He stopped. He seemed momentarily uncertain. Lesby snapped angrily. Who are you trying to fool? Months. We're a dozen light years in actual distance from Earth. You mean years, not months? Brown hesitated then. All right, a few years, but at least not a lifetime. So, if you'll promise not to scheme against me further, I'll promise. You would promise! Lesby spoke savagely. He had been taken aback by Brown's instant attempt at blackmail. But the momentary sense of defeat was gone. He knew with a stubborn rage that he would stand for no nonsense. He said in an uncompromising voice, Mr. Brown, twenty seconds after I stop speaking, you start talking. If you don't, I'll batter you against these walls. I mean it. Brown was pale. Are you going to kill me? That's all I want to know. Look, his tone was urgent. We don't have to fight anymore. We can go home, don't you see? The long madness is just about over. Nobody has to die. Lesby hesitated. What the big man said was at least partly true. There was an attempt here to make twelve years sound like twelve days, or at most twelve weeks. But the fact was, it was a short period compared to the century-long journey, which at one time had been the only possibility. He thought, am I going to kill him? It was hard to believe that he would under the circumstances. All right, if not death, then what? He sat there uncertain. The vital seconds went by, and he could see no solution. He thought finally in desperation. I'll have to give in for the moment. Even a minute thinking about this is absolutely crazy. He said aloud in utter frustration. I'll promise you this. If you can figure out how I can feel safe in a ship commanded by you, I'll give your plan consideration. And now, mister, start talking. Brown nodded. I accept that promise, he said. What we've run into here is the Lorenz Fitzgerald contraction theory. Only it's not a theory anymore. We're living the reality of it. Lesby argued, but it only took us a few hours to get to the speed of light. Brown said, as we approach light speed, space foreshortens and time compresses. What seemed like a few hours would be days in normal time and space. What Brown explained then was different rather than difficult. Lesby had to blink his mind to shut out the glare of his old ideas and habits of thought, so that the more subtle shades of superspeed phenomena could shine through into his awareness. The time compression, as Brown explained it, was gradational. The rapid initial series of accelerations were obviously designed to pin down the personnel of the ship. Subsequent increments would be according to what was necessary to attain the ultra-speed finally achieved. Since the drive was still on, it was clear that some resistance was being encountered, perhaps from the fabric of space itself. It was no time to discuss technical details. Lesby accepted the remarkable reality and said quickly, Yes, but where is Zing? My guess, said Brown, is that he did not come along. How do you mean? The space-time foreshortening did not affect him, but... Lesby began blankly. Look, said Brown harshly. Don't ask me how he did it. My picture is he stayed in the cage till after the acceleration stopped. Then, in a leisurely fashion, he released himself from the electrically locked manacles. 
climbed out and went off to some other part of the ship. He wouldn't have to hurry since by this time he was operating at a rate of, say, 500 times faster than our living pace. Lesby said, but that means he's been out there for hours his time. What's he been up to? Brown admitted that he had no answer for that. But you can see, he pointed out anxiously, that I meant what I said about going back to Earth. We have no business. In this part of space, these beings are far ahead of us scientifically. His purpose was obviously to persuade. Lesby thought, he's back to our fight. That's more important to him than any damage the real enemy is causing. A vague recollection came of the things he had read about the struggle for power throughout Earth history, how men intrigued for supremacy, while vast hordes of the invader battered down the gates. Brown was a true spiritual descendant of all those mad people. Slowly, Lesby turned and faced the big board. What was baffling to him was, what could you do against a being who moved 500 times as fast as you did? Chapter 7 he had a sudden sense of awe, a picture. At any given instant, Zing was a blur, a spot of light, a movement so rapid that even as the gaze lighted on him, he was gone to the other end of the ship and back. Yet Lesby knew it took time to traverse the great ship from end to end. Twenty, even twenty-five minutes was a normal walking time for a human being going along the corridor known as Center A. It would take the car in a full six seconds there and back. In its way, that was a significant span of time, but after Lesby had considered it for a moment, he felt appalled. What could they do against a creature who had so great a time differential in his favor? From behind him, Brown said, Why don't you use against him that remote landing control system that you set up with my permission? Lesby confessed, I did that. As soon as the acceleration ceased, but he must have been back in the faster time by then. That wouldn't make any difference, said Brown. Ah, Lesby was startled. Brown parted his lips, evidently intending to explain, and then he closed them again. Finally, he said, Make sure the intercom is off. Lesby did so, but he was realizing that Brown was up to something again. He said, and there was rage in his tone, I don't get it, and you do. Is that right? Yes, said Brown. He spoke deliberately, but he was visibly suppressing excitement. I know how to defeat this creature. That puts me in a bargaining position. Lesby's eyes were narrowed to slits. Damn you, no bargain. Tell me or else, Brown said. I'm not really trying to be difficult. You either have to kill me or come to some agreement. I want to know what that agreement is because of course I'll do it. Lesby said, I think we ought to have an election. I agree. Brown spoke instantly. You set it up. He broke off. And now release me from these tractors and I'll show you the neatest space time trick you've ever seen and that'll be the end of Zing. Lesby gazed at the man's face, saw there the same openness of countenance, the same frank, honest, that had preceded the execution order, and he thought, what can he do? He considered many possibilities and thought finally desperately, he's got the advantage over me, of superior knowledge, the most undefeatable weapon in the world, the only thing I can really hope to use against it in the final issue is my knowledge of a multitude of technician-level details. But what could Brown do against Lesby, he said unhappily to the other, before I free you, I want to lift you over to Mindell. When I do, you get his blaster for me. Sure, said Brown casually. A few moments later, he handed Mindell's gun over to Lesby. So that wasn't it. Lesby thought, There's Miller on the bridge. Can it be that Miller flashed him a ready signal when my back was turned to the board? Perhaps, like Brown, Miller had been temporarily incapacitated during the period of acceleration. It was vital that he find out Miller's present capability. Lesby tripped the intercom between the two boards. The rugged, lined face of the first officer showed large on the screen. Lesby could see the outlines of the bridge behind the man and beyond, the starry blackness of space. Lesby said courteously, Mr. Miller, how did you make out during the acceleration? It caught me by surprise, Captain. I really got a battering. I think I was out for a while, but I'm all right now. Good, said Lesby. As you probably heard, Captain Brown and I have come to an agreement and we are now going to destroy the creature that is loose on the ship. Stand by. Cynically, he broke the connection. Miller was there all right, waiting. But the question was still, what could Miller do? The answer, of course, was that Miller could preempt. Unless he asked himself, what could that do? Abruptly, it seemed to him he had the answer. It was the technician's answer that he had been mentally straining for. 
He now understood Brown's plan. They were waiting for Lesby to let down his guard for a moment. Then Miller would preempt, cut off the tractor beam from Brown and seize Lesby with it. For the two officers, it was vital that Lesby not have time to fire the blaster at Brown. Lesby thought, it's the only thing they can be worried about. The truth is there's nothing else to stop them. The solution was, Lesby realized with a savage glee, to let the two men achieve their desire. But first, Mr. Brown, he said quietly, I think you should give your information. If I agree that it is indeed the correct solution, I shall release you and we shall have an election. You and I will stay right here till the election is over. Brown said, no, I accept your promise. The speed of light is a constant and does not change in relation to moving objects. That would also apply to electromagnetic fields. Lesby said, then Zing was affected by the remote control device I turned on. Instantly, said Brown, he never got a chance to do anything. How much power did you use? Only first stage, said Lesby. But the machine-driven thought pulses in that would interfere with just about every magnetic field in his body. He couldn't do another coherent thing, Brown said in a hushed tone. It's got to be. He'll be out of control in one of the corridors, completely at our mercy. He grinned. I told you I knew how to defeat him because, of course, he was already defeated. Lesby considered that for a long moment. Eyes narrowed. He realized that he accepted the explanation, but that he had preparations to make, and quickly before Brown got suspicious of his delay. He turned to the board and switched on the intercom. People, he said, strap yourselves in again. Help those who were injured to do the same. We may have another emergency. You have several minutes, I think, but don't waste any of them. He cut off the intercom, and he activated the closed-circuit intercom of the technical stations. He said urgently, Special instruction to technical personnel. Report anything unusual, particularly if strange thought forms are going through your mind. He had an answer to that within moments after he finished speaking. A man's twangy voice came over. I keep thinking I'm somebody named Zing, and I'm trying to report to my owners. Boy, am I incoherent. Where is this D-419? Lesby punched the buttons that gave them a TV view of that particular ship location. Almost immediately, he spotted a shimmer near the floor. After a moment's survey, he ordered a heavy-duty mobile blaster brought to the corridor. By the time its colossal energies ceased, Zing was only a darkened area on the flat surface. While these events were progressing, Lesby had kept one eye on Brown and Mindel's blaster firmly gripped in his left hand. Now he said, Well, sir, you certainly did what you promised. Wait a moment while I put this gun away, and then I'll carry out my part of the bargain. He started to do so, then, out of pity, paused. He had been thinking in the back of his mind about what Brown had said earlier, that the trip to Earth might only take a few months. The officer had backed away from that statement, but it had been bothering Lesby ever since. If it were true, then it was indeed a fact that nobody need die. He said quickly, What was your reason for saying that the journey home would only take well less than a year? It's the tremendous time compression, Brown explained eagerly. The distance, as you pointed out, is over 12 light years. But with a time ratio of 3, 4, or 500 to 1, we'll make it in less than a month. When I first started to say that, I could see that the figures were incomprehensible to you in your tense mood. In fact, I could scarcely believe them myself, Lesby said, staggered. We can get back to Earth in a couple of weeks, my God, he broke off, said urgently. Look, I accept you as commander. We don't need an election. The status quo is good enough for any short period of time. Do you agree? Of course, said Brown. That's the point I've been trying to make. As he spoke, his face was utterly guileless. Lesby gazed at that mask of innocence, and he thought hopelessly, what's wrong? Why isn't he really agreeing? Is it because he doesn't want to lose his command so quickly? Sitting there, unhappily fighting for the other's life, he tried to place himself mentally in the position of the commander of a vessel, tried to look at the prospect of a return to view. It was hard to picture such a reality, but presently it seemed to him that he understood. He said gently, feeling his way, It would be kind of a shame to return without having made a successful landing anywhere. With this new speed, we could visit a dozen sun systems and still get home in a year. The look that came into Brown's face for a fleeting moment told Lesby that he had penetrated to the thought in the man's mind. The next instant, Brown was shaking his head vigorously. 
This is no time for side excursions, he said. We'll leave explorations of new star systems to future expeditions. The people of this ship have served their term. We go straight home. Brown's face was now completely relaxed. His blue eyes shone with truth and sincerity. There was nothing further that Lesby could say. The gulf between Brown and himself could not be bridged. The commander had to kill his rival so that he might finally return to Earth and report that the mission of the hope of man was accomplished. Chapter 8 In the most deliberate fashion, Lesby shoved the blaster into the inner pocket of his coat. Then, as if he were being careful, he used the tractor beam to push Brown about four feet away. There he set him down, released him from the beam, and with the same deliberateness drew his hand away from the tractor controls. Thus he made himself completely defenseless. It was the moment of vulnerability. Brown leaped at him, yelling, Miller preempt! First Officer Miller obeyed the command of his captain. What happened then? Only Lesby, the technician with a thousand bits of detailed knowledge, expected. For years, it had been observed that when control room below took over from bridge, the ship speeded up slightly. And when bridge took over from control room below, the ship slowed instantly by the same amount in each instance, something less than half a mile an hour. The two boards were not completely synchronized. The technicians often joked about it, and Lesby had once read an obscure technical explanation for the discrepancy. It had to do with the impossibility of ever getting two metals refined to the same precision of internal structure. It was the age-old story of no two objects in the universe are alike. But in times past, the differential had meant nothing. It was a technical curiosity, an interesting phenomenon of the science of metallurgy, a practical problem that caused machinists to curse good-naturedly when technicians like Lesby required them to make a replacement part. Unfortunately for Brown, the ship was now traveling near the speed of light. His strong hands, reaching towards Lesby's slighter body, were actually touching the latter's arm when the momentary deceleration occurred as Bridge took over. The sudden slowdown was at a much faster rate than even Lesby expected. The resistance of space to the forward movement of the ship must be using up more engine power than he had realized. It was taking a lot of thrust to maintain a one-gravity acceleration. The great vessel slowed about 150 miles per hour in the space of a second. Lesby took the blow of that deceleration partly against his back, partly against one side for he had half turned to defend himself from the bigger man's attack. Brown, who had nothing to grab onto, was flung forward at the full 150 miles per hour. He struck the control board with an audible thud, stuck to it as if he were glued there, and then, when the adjustment was over, when the hope of man was again speeding along at one gravity, his body slid down the face of the board and crumpled into a twisted position on the rubberized dais. His uniform was discolored. As Lesby watched, blood seeped through and dripped to the floor. Are you going to hold an election? Tellier asked. The big ship had turned back under Lesby's command and had picked up his friends. The lifeboat itself, with the remaining Karn still aboard, was put into an orbit around Alta Three, and abandoned. The two young men were sitting now in the captain's cabin. After the question was asked, Lesby leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes. He didn't need to examine his total resistance to the suggestion. He had already savored the feeling that command brought. Almost from the moment of Brown's death, he had observed himself having the same thoughts that Brown had voiced among many others. The reasons why elections were not advisable aboard a spaceship, he waited now while Elisa, one of his three wives, she being the younger of the two young widows of Brown, poured wine for them and went softly out. Then he laughed grimly. My good friend, he said, we are all lucky the time is so compressed at the speed of light. At five hundred times compression, any further exploration we do will require only a few months or years at most and so I don't think we can afford to take the chance of defeating at an election the only person who understands the details of the new acceleration method. Until I decide exactly how much exploration we shall do, I shall keep our speed capabilities a secret. But I did, and do think, one other person should know where I have this information documented. Naturally, I selected First Officer Tellier. Thank you, sir, the youth said, but he was visibly thoughtful as he sipped his wine. He went on finally. Captain, I think you'd feel a lot better if you held an election. I'm sure you could win it. Lesby laughed tolerantly, shook his head. I'm afraid you don't understand the dynamics of government, he said. 
There's no record in history of a person who actually had control handing it over. He finished with a casual confidence of absolute power. I'm not going to be presumptuous enough to fight a precedent like that. The end.